We're going to turn it back over to Bob Rivers, who's playing double duty today here as our Connect for Community Impact panel moderator. All right, thanks, Tyler. And, and once again, Mayor Spicer, congratulations uh, on this so well-deserved recognition for all that you have done and are doing in Framingham. And I'm just so pleased that you're able to join us for today's panel discussion, along with the following, who are also exemplars of social capital throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, first, we have uh, Jay Ash. I think everybody knows Jay, uh, someone who has been a past honoree and a longtime participant at these Connect for Community Impact Awards. Uh, of course, Jay is the president and CEO of the Mass Competitive Partnership and the former uh, Massachusetts Secretary of Housing and Economic Development, as well as the longtime city manager of Chelsea. So again, Jay, welcome. Great to have you with us. We also have as part of our panel discussion, Michael Curry. Uh, Michael, of course, is now the president and CEO of the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers. Uh, in addition to uh, his past many and current roles, including the past uh, president of the Boston branch of the NAACP, who continues to serve on the national NAACP board of directors, as well as both the city of Boston's COVID-19 Health and Equities Task Force and the Massachusetts Public Health Association's Task Force on Co Coronavirus and Equity. And last and certainly not least, uh, we have my friend Dan Rivera. Uh, who is now today the president and CEO of Mass Development, uh, but was the former and longtime mayor of the city of Lawrence, who, and I'm so thankful I had the opportunity to really witness this personally, who really revitalized that city uh, while leading it through the beginning of this pandemic. And of course, the Merrimack uh, Valley gas disaster in 2018, in addition to his many other contributions in that community. So uh, to all four of you, uh, thanks again uh, for taking the time to join us today uh, for this conversation. And we just can't wait to hear from you. So why don't we jump right in? Um, and really first question uh, to all of you, and, and I'll go first to Yvonne and then to Jay, Michael, and then Dan. We'll go in that order. Uh, but you know, as you know, there, there have been so many events over the past year plus that have put that stress on our collective social capital, um, as I mentioned earlier. And when you think about how social capital is actually strengthened uh, during this period, um, what are some of the things that come to mind? How have communities actually come closer together despite being physically apart? And are there any particular uh, examples or lessons learned that you would offer? So again, I'll go to our honoree, uh, the mayor, um, and, and, and look for your uh, response. Well, thanks for the question. Um, you know, one of the things I look at it, when, once this pandemic started, trying to understand what we were dealing with and what we needed to do collectively as a community was first and foremost. And I have to, I have to say, one of the things that stands out most for me is how do we protect our most vulnerable? And that would be my uh, our older adults and our children. And of course, you know, with schools, uh, we immediately uh, closed schools, but we looked at ways that we could support uh, families at home and for our older adults um, you know who are in isolation and uh, we made uh, made sure that we were connecting with them um, our, our library and uh, council on aging staff called made personal phone calls to see how people were doing and making making food deliveries uh, making sure that they had the resources they needed to feel safe and that was an ongoing um, process early on and uh, it also gave people a sense of safety that someone was looking out for them. And uh, and that has continued in making phone calls where we're contacting thousands of, of uh, residents on a regular basis. That has been tremendous. Um, and when I come back and think about uh, the, the creative ways that we've had to address issues of uh, insecurity, uh, food insecurity in our community, uh, making sure that uh, our, our students were getting what they needed at home, remote learning, uh, we were working in partnership with our school department all the time, uh, making sure that those things were happening. So uh, it was a team work effort uh, from not only city uh, employees, but the school department and our business community stepped up to the plate tremendously. So it's been wonderful. Great. Thanks for that. Jay, what comes to mind for you? Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, it's great to be uh, uh, with uh, this panel. 
Um, I admire the work of uh, each and every one of you, and uh, it's uh, great to be with you virtually. I can't wait to uh, see you all soon. Uh, Dan, it's been in, uh, and, and man, it's, probably, it's been a while since we've been able to uh, share a room together, so I look forward to that. Um, to our exemplars, exemplar, Bob Rivers, uh, thank you for uh, the example that you uh, continue to set uh, both uh, personally and, and professionally. So uh, very grateful. I have to tell you that my involvement with SCI over the years is, is uh, makes me feel, David, like uh, you've given me the tools uh, to survive during even a pandemic. Uh, what I've learned uh, beforehand about the social capital and the importance of social capital uh, really came into play uh, during this crisis. And I hope that um, the relationships that have been developed um, in the uh, understanding that we have for each other transcends this period of crisis. And that uh, um, if, if I, I'm a guy that uh, every client has a silver lining, I hope that the silver lining is that uh, the strengthened uh, relationships, the new relationships uh, that have been built will uh, allow us to, uh, to take on any and all challenges. Um, I think one of the things that I've, I've learned uh, through this, I guess I should say, been reminded about this is that uh, we're all in this together. Uh, David Crowley said earlier that, uh, you know, how much we need each other. Um, boy, was that amplified uh, during this crisis. And I'm proud to say, and I was inspired by many who stepped up and said, yes, we need each other and I'm going to be there uh, for one another. And, and um, that's been really critical. You know, there's, um, there's old sayings about crises. You never let a, a crisis go to waste is one of them. I, I would give you another one that um, a crisis is a unifier. Um, this country is divided and yet I've never felt as connected uh, to uh, many people as I have um, in the past. And so during this crisis, I think there was a, a need to pause and to look around and to really assess uh, what community means to each of us. And uh, many of us have come up with the same answer. Uh, community means taking care of, of one another. Um, and so I know for me personally, um, not only have I been inspired by so many, but um, I've once again realized the privilege that I have and uh, the obligation I have, the social capital responsibilities I have um, to share um, not only uh, time and treasure, but uh, to share uh, both leadership and followership uh, when appropriate to, uh, to make a difference. So I'm really excited about um, coming out of this pandemic as we all are, and I'm really looking forward to what the possibilities are. Um, I have to say that I think Zoom has made it possible uh, for many of us to connect in ways that we never would have connected before. Um, and um, I, um, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the, of the opportunity to uh, get to know more people uh, through this pandemic that I would never have known before. And again, I hope that the, the relationships that have been established mean that we'll be able to take on uh, and tackle greater challenges in the future. Jay, uh, again, thanks. Uh, again, thanks for those kind words. And, and thanks for all those thoughts. I can see that you're already uh, have worked ahead for the very last question we have for all of you. Uh, I'll remember, uh, crisis is a unifier. Would, would meet that standard? Uh, you may probably have others, but I appreciate the efficiency. So, uh, Michael, uh, I'll go to you next. Uh, Thank you, Bob. Thank you. And I, I echo others. It's an honor and a privilege to join um, this panel and this conversation. Bob, you've been a leader in this space for a long time of not only identifying social capital, but investing uh, in many of us who are in these spaces. And David, uh, the work that SEI does, tremendous. I'm a huge fan of the SEI AmeriCorps program uh, and the work that you're doing there. So <clears throat> pleasure to be here. Um, mayor Spicer uh, and, and my former mayor, Dan Rivera, good friends, and, and we've been allies and partners in this work for a long time. You know, I think a good friend said it to me once before. He said, it took a pandemic and being forced to stay at home. It took George Floyd's murder to give us 2020 vision. And of course, you think of all this stuff happened in 2020. It gave us 2020 vision because we couldn't run out of the house. We had to pay attention to that what once was eight minutes and 46 seconds became nine minutes and 29 seconds and pay attention to those disparities and those death rates and those infection rates playing out on our screens on a daily basis. And it made us look around at ourselves, at our communities and identify who we needed to partner with and collaborate with. I've never seen it, Bob, and I've been doing this work a long time where you had government working with the philanthropic community, working with activists, Working, working with community organizers, working with healthcare providers. I, I don't know if we can maintain that, Bob, but I am hoping and praying that we learned a lesson to Jay's point, that this crea crisis created an opportunity for us 
we can solve big problems. And I think about on the front end of a pandemic and a, a clinical trials that we saw, we found vaccines in a historic timeline of, you know, quick turnaround of several vaccines. That's no accident, right? That took partnerships, that took investment, that took having people at the table. And quite frankly, there was historic uh, participation of people of color. I think about Karen Edmonds at Harvard Chan School, who I work with, and Rebecca Lee, who we now do clinical trials, uh, and we're doing this research work with community at the table to talk about what they're doing. So you have people from the community engage with researchers around how do you build equity in the research. And then we've talked about how to do testing, vaccinations, you have partnerships like East Boston Neighborhood Health Center and the Chelsea community, uh, and that is across our health center network in the state. I, I am uh, concerned that we still are not out of this pandemic, but I'm optimistic that these partnerships have borne a new reality around how we address poverty, housing insecurity, food insecurity, racism, and if we can just marshal all of our resources, we can do great things. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, um, you know, thank you for your leadership, Michael, and and I and I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, this this moment is becoming a movement, um, and I had my doubts that six months after the murder of George Floyd, that we would have the same interest, engagement, and momentum. And I dare say it's even higher and more sustainable now. And again, it's because of, of your longtime leadership, your voice, and, and thank you so much for sharing that. So Dan, I'll now go uh, to you. Good to see you. Thank you so much. And again, it's it's a, an honor to be part of this, this team. Um, thanks. It, Jay Ash was one of the first people I met with uh, when I became mayor, asked him how, how in the world am I gonna do economic development? He said, don't worry about it. We got it in Chelsea. I'll help your brother, I'll help your brother out. And he did, uh, you know, Michael and I sat and listened to the conversations about the um, the, the vaccinations and all that stuff, the rollout. And uh, we kept, we had to keep remembering people, the only people not complaining about getting the, the, the vaccination are poor people and people of color. What are we doing here? But I, I think the message got up to the governor and his team. And I think they, they eventually got around to that stuff. I think my friendship with Michael and the work they do in the NAACP, I appreciate it. And you know, uh, when you're uh, a person of color and you're a mayor, when you see another one come on the spot, you're just so happy to be more than one. <laughs> and yeah. so we're so happy to have spent this small, small time together and, and, and thanks to Social Capital um, for pointing out the great work uh, of the mayor, Dr. Spicer. I appreciate it. You know, uh, I read, we were reading this book, um, you know, Thank You for Being Late, Thomas Freeman. He, t he talks about 2007 being an inflection point in technology. Um, I love the way Michael put it, 2020 vision. I think it's going to be an inflection point for social capital. Imagine if we did not have that social capital that a nonprofit could uh, easily stand up a food bank and support restaurants in the use of that. That was social capital. They did it without before the government money could show up. You know, imagine if we didn't have the social capital um, set up where people um, knew where the elderly were. They knew where the people with the most need were. And you know, government for all its, its its strengths. And you know, being a mayor, I knew that was an agent for government. But that social capital was really critical to get the, the need to the ground. And I think that hopefully that'll be the longest lasting piece of it. Uh, I I told somebody that the stuff that will stick with us is the stuff that was going to help us uh, the fastest to be safest. All that other stuff that didn't really make us safer. Maybe we'll have a longer tail on fixing transportation. Maybe we'll have a longer trail on some other stuff, but you know, uh, the technology to help us feed each other, the methods and networks to help us keep us physically, you know, you know the work of the, the community health centers, that is uh, uh, what's gonna, I think at the end of the day, stay with us. Yeah, thanks for that, Dan. And, and I wanna pick up on, on those comments and, and go back to you, Michael, and really, you know, underscore something that you said in your remarks. I mean, as you highlighted, the pandemic put a spotlight on the many disparities borne by communities of color, in particular, healthcare, housing, education, employment, wealth inequities, and so on. Um, how can we work better together to create more equitable communities? There's just so many, many of us that are on the call that are working on this or want to work on this. And um, what are some of the ways that we can engage? Yeah, you know, it's so funny, Bob, and I know this is a tough one for many of us. We often don't want to look back at the past, 
but I think for our mayors who run cities, for you who run an organization, for David uh, who runs SEI, you know that part of charting a way forward is figuring out what you've done in the past, how we got to this moment. So I'm a big proponent of going back and looking at how do we got, how we got to these housing inequities, these education inequities, these economic disparities. I think about that uh, Federal Reserve Bank's Color of Wealth in Boston report. I think about the Institute of Medicine's report, Unequal Treatment, that documented the disparities and how we got here to folks like uh, myself and Dan Rivera are more likely to have prostate cancer and die of prostate cancer or uh, breast cancer, if you're Yvonne Mayor Spicer. Like, how did we get here, I think, is the first step. And we've not wanted to do that. There is something um, unsettling about looking at the past. Um, looking at mass incarceration, looking at uh, housing, it's all these issues. So I think the first step, and I think I'm preaching to the choir of the other panelists on this call, we understand that we have to look at it. And then once you look at it, you can figure out a strategy forward. And then I want, you know, I tell people all the time, and I've said that to the mayor in Boston, both current and past mayors, back to Menino, we need to see urgency because these are life or death issues. And we know that if you're dealing with these issues on the ground in communities that we've all served, there's an urgency to solving them. But you don't always see that at the higher levels. You've shown that, Bob. Uh, I deal with legislators who show that, mayors who show that, but we don't see it across all sectors, all industry and all government. And I think if we can get the, the history and the urgency, we can really uh, deal with these uh, longstanding inequities um, that uh, quite frankly are taking lives. And it's not just about the knees on our neck. Right? It's not just about the knees on our neck because quite frankly, from a healthcare perspective, many more people are dying of disease mm -hmm. at a higher rate than by police violence, but I don't see the urgency there either. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And you mentioned the Federal Reserve Bank of Austin's Color of Money report, which I know you and others uh, here on the call are involved with uh, an effort to update that report and build upon it uh, to come up with a roadmap really to better address going forward. But again, uh, as you mentioned, Michael, not forgetting the past and, and understanding how did we get here? So I'll now turn it to you, Mayor Spicer, uh, to comment on same. Uh, what sort of uh, recommendations we, we do have for us in addressing these racial disparities? Well, I, I think Michael laid the foundation of, of where we need to go. We have to name it. You can't do anything about it until you name it. And uh, in this process, you also need to have not only allies, but accomplices, people willing to step up and roll up their seats and say, yes, we're going to change this. This is no longer going to happen. And, you know, as the mayor of the city, uh, throughout this pandemic, I, you know, really looking at some of the inequities around who was dying from COVID, who was get, getting COVID. And, and, I, and in my city, in my city, small city, I could draw a heat map and show you exactly where that was happening in my city and it's my black and brown community, oftentimes living in less than substandard housing. And that was the reality in my city. And I, and I did what I needed to do to help keep them safe, but also their family safe and go above and beyond the precursory things. I declared racism a public health crisis in my city. And I, you know, and I did it deliberately. I did it in, with intentionality of how do we take the veil off of these little innuendos that happen in suburban communities like Framingham, as well as major cities, as well as rural communities. So we know what has been happening. And trying to think about how the disparity of teaching and learning that was happening as a result of remote learning. You know, we've invested uh, you know, over a million dollars in helping buy Chromebooks in our uh, city, and particularly focusing on our communities of color that did not have access. So it's, you know, it's a, the notion of leveling the playing field of equity and also being very deliberate in your actions that it, it will make those small incremental steps. But we all do have to have that sense of urgency that this is not a nice to do or a good thing to do. It is a must do if we are truly going to be an inclusive society that respects and values diversity in all its forms, but also sees an opportunity for everyone to participate in the social capital equity uh, movement. We've got to make sure everybody's at the table. And, uh, and really remind ourselves when we are in a space, we look and see who's here, but we also look and say, who's not here? And no question about it. And, and again, as I go to uh, 
sort of variant on this question to Dan and then to Jay, you know, in my own observation, and I know in all of ours, you know, typically on these kinds of conversations long before the murder of George Floyd, you always found government engaged, you always saw the nonprofit sector engaged, but business community sometimes not so much. Uh, but we have seen it. We've seen it in Lawrence, Dan, right? Uh, Lawrence Partnership, other efforts you've been involved with. So if you think about the effective collaboration between all sectors and all constituents in the community, what do you see as really sort of the, the key to that, the essence of it? What makes that work? So I, I got to tell you, for me, it, it was always, uh, again, going back to this piece that we knew each other. Uh, I, I went, Harvard had the, the, the boot camp for new mayors. And uh, I remember the, the the story that the chief of police talked to us about, chief of police. You better know the people that you will find yourself on with at one o'clock in the morning on the tarmac, trying to tell families of what's going on. So have collaborative conversations, have these interactions beforehand, because if not, you when problems come, it's gonna make it harder to solve. And so having a strong business community, the partnership has done that. Um, and, and really try to get to the ground, you know, and really try to interact with people um, in, in small business districts in Lawrence, um, in large business districts in Lawrence. And, and the piece for me, I think the, the secret sauce really is, and this is not me shirking work, it might look that way, but staying out of the way. Government needs to know when to put themselves in the way, in the thing and stay, and when to stay out of the way. And so give them the ball. I, I think the, the role is set the goalposts, set the boundaries, what's out of bounds, what's in bounds, and let them play. And the best conversations is when the nonprofits, they, they're bringing the, 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 the businesses to task and, and bringing them along and say, it's okay, we know you're coming from behind, but come with us, we'll, we'll get you along the way. And because you have those um, conversations beforehand, it's not adversarial. It's like, oh, I'm not going to go to this meeting with nonprofits. They already knew each other. And, you know, and Heather McMahon, uh, and, uh, you know, and folks like that in Lawrence had already had conversations with people in the industrial in the industrial zone in Lawrence. So when the problems were happening and we we had we had a head start on everybody with the, with the gas crisis, we had muscle memory. The folks who had those in this community who had some similar types of muscle memories, not because of tragedy, but because of those things. I think that's what's going to be the difference. Um, but don't forget, the important part is for government to let them do their thing uh, and be a supportive player. Yeah, thanks for that, Dan. It looks like you, you, I've already picked up a five-word answer to the final round question in yours, too. So thanks for that. So, Jay, you, Jay you've been a, a long-time, uh, really, convener, instigator around engagement of the business community in these issues. So, so what have you seen that is most effective in bringing everybody together? You know, I, I, so many thoughts uh, come to mind. Uh, Michael, I want to congratulate you for uh, all that you've done, uh, not only in the region, but in the country around uh, very important uh, issues of, of equity and, and equality. And, and I want to apologize to everybody that it's 2021 and we're still talking about these things. Mm. Um, that's mm. the bad news as far as I'm concerned. Right. I can't believe that it's 2021 and we're not where we should be. On the other hand, what an exciting time to be in a position of leadership where you can have an impact. And Bob, to your point, and, and you know, to, to support the leadership that you've had over the years, uh, I think we've arrived at a moment of time where the, um, the crisis that is unifying is, is turning into action. I'll give you an example, if I could, a real life example, MACP. When I interviewed um, to uh, be in this position uh, three years ago, I did what everybody does for an interview. I went on the company's website, and uh, try to learn more about the, um, uh, about the organization. Do you know on our organization website three years ago, the word equity, racial equity, was not found anywhere. The term racial equity was not found anywhere. Mm -hmm. Now let's fast forward. Unfortunately, murders of, of George Floyd and others, <laughs> pandemic that has uh, caused so much lives to, uh, to be lost and so much disrupt disruption, but let's fast forward to this period of time now where this organization, and uh, we're not the only organization that's done this, has taken a deep look at what we do and how we do it. And not only have we narrowed down so we can go deeper um, into uh, issues, but social justice is one of the four areas that we've narrowed down to. And that's a huge statement about uh, what the business community thinks. And, and we have, you know, the Michael Curries who have been calling us out um, for all well, these many years and decades and, and unfortunately generations. And we have examples like 
uh, Bob Rivers, who have um, continually remind the business community what the possibilities are that have caused now every company to look both internally and externally at what we're doing and how we do it. And I'm really proud of the uh, 17 now CEOs that I work with that they've said, you know, we want to we want to work very uh, directly on issues that affect our society. And we think that one of the four most important issues that we work on is social diversity, uh, social uh, justice. You know, um, Mayor Spicer said that um, everyone needs to be at the table and I couldn't agree more. And I'm glad to see uh, that more and more people are at the table. But when you come to the table, it's important that you leave all the baggage behind and you open yourself up to some very important concepts. And these concepts are, are ones that um, I began learned through uh, the many years that I've worked uh, with uh, SCI um, and have implemented and, and institutionalized in my own work that I think are very important. You need to respect um, those who are uh, you're with. And I, and I feel like there's a greater level of respect uh, from um, all sectors uh, of our um, society now. You need to trust that people um, know what they're talking about and are honest and are um, genuine. Um, in what they're uh, trying to accomplish. The greatest thing, I think, is you need to listen more than you talk. And um, in listening to others, um, you, you quickly find that uh, lots of other people have credible answers as well. And it's, it's really important that um, you listen instead of just going into a room to talk. And I, and I get the sense that, there's a, that we've created a shared purpose, and it's up to all of us. I mean, the... the both the opportunity is the burden. It's up to all of us to make sure that that shared pur purpose translates into listening to each other and then acting upon uh, what we hear. And I think, I think at no other time in my life are we, um, are we in a position where we can actually now um, take upon all this and, 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 and really build upon it to make sure that we have a, a fairer, uh, more just, and um, an equal society. Yeah, well said, Jay. And uh, again, it's uh, to, to all of our participants today, if you have any questions for the panel, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, you can call them out. We could, uh, but chat's a little bit better. So while we're waiting for any questions that uh, you all might have, I've got a last one for our panel. And Jay, I'm going to go right back to you. Um, you know, so many people who have joined us today, I think just, just the mere act of joining this event indicates that they want to have an even greater positive impact in their communities. So if you had to distill that advice to five words, and I mean, heck, you did it earlier, crisis is a unifier, uh, but you probably have others, I'm sure. What are there other, other five words, uh, another five word phrase that you might express? Am I allowed to use a hyphen? Sure, So uh, that's free. We'll walk get in the, this is an old one. It's an old one, but it's-, it's you know, I, I, Can I just say, I, can I just say, I thought Jay was gonna, I thought Jay was gonna say, am I allowed to curse? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a, an oldie but a goodie, you know, uh, uh, walk in the footsteps of others. Um, it's so important and, and the more that you do that, the more that you're open to um, understand what other people uh, suffer through, the, the better off that you are in trying to then um, address it. Yeah, well, well done. Uh, Dan, how about you? Uh, I'm going to go, you know, in my new, in my new role, there, it would probably be you know, things around economic development, but I got I gotta go back to this thing um, that's very important. And, and this is an important question because words today matter more important, you know, not allies, but uh, accomplices, uh, intentionality. Well, I'm trying to do it. Were you being intentional? Because if you were on fire, you'd be intentional to put that out. And so uh, I, I think the words really matter. So the words that I wanna share with everybody here is uh, run for office. Yeah. Elections have consequences. Uh, and if you think that the electoral process without your presence is gonna elect the best uh, people to office, I think you're mistaken. Put your hat in the ring, run for school committee, city council, town, town meeting, mayor, do your thing because it, even if you don't get it the first time, it lifts the conversation, run for office. Yeah, nicely done. Michael? Um, heartened and, uh, and uh, thankful for all those people who took to the streets over the last year and, and marched and protested and showed up. But my five words, Bob, would be listen, learn, show up, and contribute. And I'll do a dash at Jay's uh, direction with courage. With courage is the key part. 
yeah. contribute with courage. Yeah, indeed. Thanks. And we'll, we'll bring it home uh, with today's honoree, uh, Mayor Spicer. Wow. Following all my brothers here, it is all, but one that came to mind for me is just remember, I am my brother slash sister's keeper. You are not in this alone. We are a team. And uh, when we keep others at the forefront, we never lose sight of our direction. So remember, we're in it together. Yeah, great, great. Thank you. And uh, I know we're pretty much at time, but uh, I don't see any questions um, uh, in the chat, but we have one. We have one. If we got a couple minutes to get to it and probably can't to get to everyone, all four on this. Um, but someone asked in the chat, you know, not, not all leaders have the courage to create change. And, and how do we support their leadership to give them that courage to shift that mindset? And, and Michael, since you called it out, I'll go to you. Well, you know, this is a little controversial when I say this, but Mayor Spicer and, and I uh, would have, uh, and, and Mayor Rivera would appreciate this. You know, I've never seen more, more DEI experts than I have in the last year. <laughs> so, you know, I think part of that point in that is I think um, the collective of us mm -hmm. has made it possible for others to, to lend their voice to the conversation when in fact people were quiet. You know, I, I posted on social media, Bob, a few days ago, I posted um, some, I'm glad so many are waking up and I, I'm, I'm glad so many people are woke and others are waking up, but some of us are insomniacs. Because mm. the reality is, is people have been saying these things for decades but now others are finding the courage to actually step out in a boardroom, a classroom, uh, in a community meeting and say the things that are necessary to hold us accountable as a society. And I think that's refreshing to be in rooms where people in the corporate level on down uh, and on up are willing to say the, the things that are necessary to get us to a better place. So um, I, I'm glad people are waking up, they're woke, but I appreciate I'm on the line with insomniacs right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, Michael, thanks for that. You know, one of the things you said earlier was another question in the chat. And we don't have time to get into it, but it's, you know, uh, you know I think many of us have been reawakened reawake for the first time in some cases to the fact that the uh, Tulsa massacre mm -hmm. 100 years ago, I mean, this is a story that's yeah. never been told um, that uh, very few of us had ever heard of before. Uh, and again, as you mentioned before, we can't really address the future without first understanding the past mm -hmm. and Bob, uh, Bob, Bob can I say this piece because I, I think that I think just again to reinforce the piece that Mike said about showing up if you want the people who use leaders to, to, to be brave you have to show up and vote for brave leadership and or, or to empower them to be brave mm -hmm. because it is not easy to you know to to, to lever uh, power to to help in a, in a non-traditional manner and so I say that that's my like political way of saying, if you want them to be tough, they got to have a group of people behind them. So you either got to show up at the ballot box, or you got to show up at the community meetings, and you got to support them while you listen and act. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I have pictures of like the Mel King era uh, and, and back in the day, like this, the rooms are packed full of people. That's what you need to keep doing so people can be brave because elected officials are not, uh, what's the word, uh, incentivized uh, to be forward thinking because if they get too ahead of the crowd, they also could get fired. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks everyone. We have to call it there. Um, you know, Kyle was giving me the yellow card, so I got to turn it back to him. But I want to thank each of you for being part of the uh, part of the panel, sharing your thoughts and your wisdom. And of course, most of all for your leadership mm -hmm. every day. Um, so with that, Tyler, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate all of the discussion from the panelists. What a wonderful, wonderful discussion. I have a whole notepad of notes here. And thank you to Bob for guiding us through this conversation. A couple of things before we wrap up today. We do have one more event coming up in the series. Next Thursday at noon, we will be presenting the 2021 Capitalist Idealist Award to Betty and Paul Francisco and Yolando, uh, Yolanda, excuse me, uh, Quantro. There is some time to donate to our fundraiser. Remember, this is our biggest fundraiser of the year and we still have some work to do <clears> left. <throat> we have raised just shy of 2,700 so far and we need to get up to 1,200 by the end of next week to uh, fulfill SCI's mission for another wonderful year. You can add to this total by texting SCI 2021 to 50155. 
And the SCI is also a great way to support SCI's mission. There's a lot of great items. I have my eye on a couple of Andrew's wonderful photos and frames, uh, in addition to some lovely wine that I saw there from my wife. Uh, if you go to the link in the chat, or you can go to the link in the chat, I should say, or write to socialcapitalinc.org and click the Add auction button to participate. On behalf of the board and the SCI team, I would like to thank you for coming today. Thank you for the support of SCI and your interest in our discussion about how we can best collaborate to create healthy communities where we all can thrive.